So our webinar is on thoroughbred pregnancy and foal health. Um, we have a great panel, as I mentioned. We have Chris Hughes from Charleston University, who will be presenting on the effects of fecal microbiota transplant therapy on infectious diarrhea and foals. Hello, Chris. We have Dr. Joan Carrick, uh, who will be presenting some key findings identified in the pathology and epidemiology of equine pregnancy loss uh, research project. And finally, we will have James Murray um, of Thoroughbred Breeds Australia on phase two of the post-mortem project. Now, a bit of housekeeping. Um, as normal, we'll have everyone jump on, um, talk through their presentation, and then we'll ask any questions you have at the end. And if we can't get to your question, um, we will get back to you after the webinar. This webinar will be recorded. Um, so you can watch it back later or send it to um, some of your friends that you might have. So I'm going to hand over tonight to Annalise to kick things off. Uh, thanks, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us tonight. I'm just going to do a brief run through about the Thoroughbred Horses program to give you a bit of background before we uh, get into the presentations. So the Thoroughbred Horses program is one of, an, of 13 levied industries that are managed by AgriFutures Australia. The Thoroughbred Horses Program invests levy funds on behalf of thoroughbred breeders. The levy consists of $10 from every mare returned paid by the mare owner and $10 from every mare served paid by the stallion owner. The levies are then matched by the Commonwealth Government at 50 cents for every dollar spent on research and development. Currently, the program has 24 ongoing projects and some of our recent key achievements are a management uh, of heat stress in stallions. We have a couple of really good documents on our website around that and I'll put um, a link to our website in the chat. Uh, and then we also have done a quicker test for chlamydia and herpes. Uh, we have also uh, invested in using advanced diagnostic imaging for thoroughbred horses in racing. And we also do a fair bit of industry support. We fund uh, fast track positions, which is one of the Thoroughbred Breeders Australia initiatives. We have got a Vet Horizon Scholar, who is a, a, um, a vet student at the University of Queensland and we also supported the Thoroughbred Welfare Initiative which we discussed in our last webinar. So I think one of the big things that we're doing uh, in the Thoroughbred Horses program at the moment is that we are planning our uh, investments for the next five years. So we are putting together the Thoroughbred Horses Program strategic plan for the next five years which will guide our research and development um, for that five years. We have finished drafting it, but the most important part is yet to come, and that's the public consultation part. I really would uh, appreciate if everybody could uh, get uh, online and join our um, uh, our newsletter because the uh, webinar, uh, sorry, the, the public consultation for the five-year plan will go out through our uh, through our newsletter. So uh, what we will do is we will get public consultation, we will get any comments back from anyone and then we'll finish that off and we will release the the uh, the next five year plan hopefully in September. So as Charmaine noted that's a very brief overview of the Thoroughbred Horses Levy Program. We've got Chris um, talking next about transplant therapy. We've got Dr. Joan Carrick talking about pathology and epidemiology of pregnancy loss. And then we've got James from Thoroughbred Breeders Australia talking about the next phase of the post-mortem program. So I will now hand over to Chris. So thanks, Chris. Uh, this is just a brief overview of, of a project that we've been running for the last couple of years uh, through Charles Sturt University. And this is looking at diarrhoea in foals and, and looking at new strategies in which we may be able to manage this condition and, and hopefully get better outcomes and, and, and faster outcomes in terms of, of uh, resolution of, of diarrhoea. So th this is the, the, the official title of, of the project. Um, and, and what this really means is using um, 
Fecal material, manure from a healthy horse and transplanting that into an animal with uh, uh, infectious diarrhea to try and re-establish the balance of, of the microbiota, which is the complex uh, community of microorganisms normally in the bowel, to, to hopefully re-establish health and, and fast track management of, of the diarrhea. And in terms of diarrhea, I'm sure we're all familiar with it as being a common problem in, in foals. And up to 60 to 80 percent of foals, um, depending on, on, on the year, less than six months of age, will be affected by diarrhea. Now, as, as the, uh, the, the flow diagram on the right, some of these are non-infectious and, and of, of less importance. But others are, are, are more more problematic, particularly those with an infectious nature, um, either being bacterial, viral, or, or parasitic. And and it's those infectious causes of, of diarrhea that can have real impact, both on in the terms of of the individual foal. And here's an example of a foal with with marked clinical consequences of of diarrhea. And, and that's at the individual animal level, but we've also got considerations around how diarrhea may spread between animals, and so we can have outbreaks on, on the farm. But we also need to think about ourselves because uh, some of the agents of, of diarrhea in foals are what we call zoonotic. So, so humans can directly or indirectly also be infected with those with those pathogens. And, and a good example would be salmonella. And we certainly have um, endemic issues with salmonella in, in Australia in, in our horse population. And, and when we're thinking about infectious causes of diarrhea, what we start to get concerned about are uh, disruptions to the normal balance of the of the bugs in the bowel, and so we're we're talking about the microbiota and and the fancy term that we use in terms of of that disruption is dysbiosis. And when we have an animal with, and this is for a foal or an adult, truth be told, when when we have an animal with diarrhea, um, particularly a foal, we're we're thinking about what are our treatment targets? How can we manage this condition? And so we often use anti-inflammatory treatments. These animals often have fluid deficits, and so we have uh, 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 targeted strategies in terms of providing intravenous or oral fluids and nutritional support of the animal. We like to think that intestinal protectants may be of benefit where we can can almost form a barrier on the lining of, of the intestine to, to lessen the, the likelihood of damage, but that may be wishful thinking. And we often do resort to the use of antimicrobial drugs, but when we, when we think about that, it, that doesn't necessarily allow management of that dysbiosis. And so here's a schematic of lots of bugs in the bowel. And so we need to think about how we can best address that and try not to overuse antimicrobials because so antibiotic drugs, because that's going to increase the risk of, of certain complications, either clinical, but also um, increasing the, the risk of the prevalence of um, antimicrobial associated resistance. So when what do I mean by the fecal microbiota? Well, as I said at the start, this is the complex population of microorganisms, bacteria, viruses, protozoa, etc., that normally are located within the alimentary tract. It's the most genetically diverse population on the on the planet, and, and, and we're all carrying them around in, inside us. So we've got this rich and diverse population as as schematically demonstrated up in, in the top right there. And, and this microbiota has a has a really important role and it's been uh, investigated extensively in, in, in the human healthcare settings where the microbiota is so important for the for intestinal health, but also health beyond the, the confines of the alimentary tract, immunity and brain health and, and other organ and endocrine uh, function. So, so it occupies a really important role. In terms of the setting of this project, what we're really focusing on is, is the roles in terms of regulating gut inflammation and the risk of, of diarrhea. So we have done some work. There is work ongoing in looking at the microbiota in, in horses. And, and as you can see, there's a number of studies that have been published and, and we're continuing to get new studies. And, and these studies are providing 
really useful foundation information. We're getting an understanding of what the population looks like. You know, it's not just one individual bacteria down there. We're, we're dealing with a with a very diverse population. And, and so if we look at, at that schematically, instead of thinking about individual microorganisms, salmonella, E. coli, whatever it may be, we need to start thinking about them as, as this big interrelated uh, community uh, and population of, of, of bugs in the in the intestine. We're now also starting to get an appreciation of how disease can disrupt that. And, and again, we're riding on the coattails of human medicine where it's clear that there's a whole raft of, of conditions that can disrupt this normal microbiota. And one of those in the horse that we're starting to get evidence of is, is diarrhea. So both foals and adult horses with diarrhea, we know will have a disruption to that microbiota. But we don't have a good understanding of the effects of treatment, either inadvertent or deliberate attempts to, to alter that microbiota. And if we think about antimicrobials, we yes, we use them and, and they are an important part of our arsenal for a whole variety of, of treatment strategies in, in any healthcare setting, including horses. When we use this to target a very specific microorganism, let's say salmonella, for example, we've got salmonella in the crosshairs, we're using a drug that we know um, based on laboratory testing should get salmonella. And when we look at the microbiota in the elementary tract, we might take out salmonella to a degree, but we may also take out non-target bacteria as well. And so that can actually further disrupt that normal balance of, of, of the, the bacteria in the bowel. So it could ac actually accentuate that dysbiosis. Conversely, what we're, we're now moving towards is, well, can we try and re-establish the balance of that, that, that in, uh, very complex population of bacteria in, in the horse's bowel by transplanting manure from a healthy horse that's hopefully got the bacteria in all the right balance to address that disruption that, that the underlying condition has caused. We've got some evidence based uh, from the from uh, recent studies published in the literature that in adult horses with diarrhea, admittedly small numbers, but in adult horses, it seems to have a beneficial effect in terms of improving the microbiota and improving clinical outcomes. So our, our objectives in this study was, was to look at fecal mi microbiota transplants. And so the easiest way to think about it is a poo shake. And, and look at that in, in three settings. What's the safety of, of uh, these um, uh, treatments. What are the clinical effects? You know, are we getting a beneficial outcome in terms of diarrhea and, and clinical resolution? And but also, what's specifically happening at the level of the microbiota? Are we changing that population um, in our favour? We also want to get get some idea of what the pathogens um, uh, uh, that are causing diarrhea in our foal populations in, in Australia. So we're sort of getting some initial data on, okay, who are the main culprits that we're having to deal with? And then with these treatments, we need to be mindful there potentially could be complications. So are we seeing any, any complications? And the microbiota transplants, that's not a new concept. And whilst it's not very uh, sexy science, so to speak, it's actually a very useful uh, treatment for certain conditions in human medicine, and in particular, Clostridium difficile. It's a problematic bacteria that can cause long-standing and very problematic inflammatory bowel disease syndromes in humans. And fecal mi microbiota transplantation has been shown to, to result in really good outcomes in, in those settings and, and indeed in other clinical settings as well in, in human gastroenterology. So, so this certainly runs on the board from a human healthcare perspective. Now we need to see whether we're going to see that in, in horses. So how do we go about it? We've been recruiting foals with, with diarrhoea and, and then randomly assigning them to either control, so they just get saline um, as, as, as a specific enter, enteral treatment, or they're getting the, the, the so-called poo shake, where we collect faeces from a healthy donor horse, we uh, fresh, uh, we, we blend it up, we get, basically get the, the liquid, and then we, we administer that by nasogastric tube to the horse, and we do that to the foal. So we do that three times, 
and at each time we also collect a faecal sample to then do some more sophisticated uh, laboratory work which we're about to embark on. So that's where we we actually extract the DNA, the bacterial DNA from the sample and using um, uh, laboratory methods, we can actually sequence the genes. And so we can actually get a very sophisticated um, analysis of which bacteria are there, what, pop, what, what proportions, and, and also how they change with disease and also how they change with, with treatment. And so, so sort of looking at, at both the effects of the disease, but also the treatment effects on the, the microbiota. So the results to date, we've, we've got close to 26 foals that have been recruited. And we've from those um, foals, we've identified a number of pathogens and, and I've just listed them, them on that on the slide there. Cryptosporidium, which is a parasite, certain bacteria, including salmonella and clostridial species, and also rotavirus. And some of these foals have actually had infection with more than one pathogen. So we've had, um, for example, foals that have had both cryptosporidium and rotavirus. And so there's a concern that that, that may have an amplifying effect on disruption to the microbiota. We've had no adverse effects in foals that have been treated with a, with a microbiota, and, and, and that reflects also our experiences in, in adult horses. So it does seem to be a safe uh, treatment. If we think about it, foals as part of their normal development will actually eat mares feces. And so coprophagy is, is the term, and that's you know, really establishing the normal flora and, and the bacteria in their intestines. So, so it's encouraging that, that we're not seeing any adverse effects. From a clinical effects, the interim results, we haven't done all the data analysis yet, but in, certainly in some animals that have been treated, we, we certainly get the sense that there's an overall shortage duration of the diarrhea. So, so it may facilitate resolution. I need to hasten to add, these foals are also getting managed according to their clinical need with intravenous fluids, um, anti-inflammatories, um, treatments for, for toxemia, et cetera. So they're not just getting the, the poo shake, they're also getting the other standard components to, the, to, the, to their management. And we're also seeing improvement in clinical science and some of the laboratory data. And so that's, that's cause for cautious optimism, but we need to be mindful we haven't analysed all the clinical data. We, we've, we've still got um, um, some, some further work to do to, to, to get great, greater sort of uh, 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 scientific assessment of, of the effects of both the disease, but also treatment on, on outcomes. We're about to, this month, we're about to start our, our laboratory, our sophisticated laboratory methods as far as the DNA extra, extraction and, and PCR um, analyses and, and getting in a position where we're going to be able to do our, our gene sequencing and, and progress through to, to the more sophisticated data analysis. So that 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 is still uh, pending. In terms of the practical application of, of these res results, and I appreciate this is a real whistle-stop tour for, for this project um, and, our, and, and what we've found so far, but I think faecal microbiota transplants certainly should be considered in the management of, of foal diarrhoea. A few things that are important around that, though, it, it is important to, to identify a good donor horse. And so we, we've done that in our, in our colleagues that we're working with and other practices where we've got a resident horse that isn't being treated with antibiotics, uh, doesn't have any clinical um, abnormalities, um, and are also screened for imp important pathogens that could be transmitted through through feces, so, so certain bacteria and viruses, et cetera. So that's important to be able to do that. And, and we do that every every year. We screen our donor horses, and this may also lead to an an opportunity for us as a, as an industry to reduce our antimicrobial use in, in in diarrhea cases. So, what's the overall benefit and impact that we anticipate is going to come out of this study? We're certainly expanding our understanding of the microbiota and also uh, dysbiosis in horses and we're using very established and sophisticated uh, methods and this is going to hopefully lead to evidence-based advances in our management of, of foals with diarrhea and that's of relevance to all stakeholders within our industry 
and um, our, our, our breeders, our veterinarians, our, our funding colleagues, and, and also the, the more broadly in the community at large in terms of assurance of, of improvements in animal wellbeing and health. And if we can move to reduce antimicrobial use, that's hopefully also going to lessen the the selection pressure for antimicrobial resistance, which is a big problem, um, both in, in veterinary medicine, but also in, in, in human medicine. So just to, to finish off, I also want to, to uh, uh, draw acknowledgement to uh, the staff and students at both the Veterinary Clinical Centre where I work at, at Charles State University and also the Diagnostic Laboratory here who's, who's done some of the screening work um, and also colleagues who are contributors to uh, the study in, in um, case uh, recruitment, at both at Scone Equine Hospital and also South e uh, Eastern Equine Hospital. Um, so I'm going to stop uh, sharing now, and and I'm very welcome. Uh, I'm very happy to um, entertain any questions. Excellent. Thanks, Chris. Yes. Um, Jenny, you have a question. Uh, yes. Thanks. Very interesting. Um, Two things, you said 20% of the infections are infectious. I'm just interested what loss of life or what the impact of that bad, you know, bad infectious one is. And two, I'm interested if any other uh, species of animal, I know in livestock and cattle particularly, um, salmonella can be a, a major problem and I don't know if any of the other species have done similar work and what the outcomes have been. Thank you. Yeah, good good questions, Jenny. And in terms of, of those those figures that are that are provided are pretty rug, rubber in and, and look they can vary across populations. In terms of the 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 more problematic uh, causes of diarrhea, um in, in salmonella, for example, um, some of the, cl the clostridial uh, causes, look, that can be fatal, absolutely. And, and we do lose foals to, to those, those conditions. Um, uh, not every foal with salmonella, not every foal with clostridium difficile, for example, is going to, to succumb to the condition and, and, and die. Uh, but they are more challenging in terms of therapeutic management and the intensive uh, requirements for treatment, and that also then extends to to, to greater costs. And look, in terms of of mortality rates, I would say, uh, dependent on on the the condition in the year, we might lose 10 10 percent. Your, your other question in terms of other species, that's a really really important consideration, and it is done in in ruminants. And again ruminal transplants so uh, are done in cattle to and for a very similar reason to try and re-establish the normal uh, balance of the microbiota within the rumen so the rumen in, in a in a uh, ruminant uh, in particular cattle but also sheep this has been done that the transplant that's their main fermentation vat Whereas in a in a horse, it's it's more more uh, the the large intestine, so they're actually at the other end of the alimentary tract. But it certainly uh, is has been established as as an effective avenue to to manage certain types of of disruption to uh, to the bowel in in cattle. There's a little bit of work in other species as well, including dogs. So 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 there's some evidence in small animals that this may be an avenue in which we can modify to our benefit what's happening in the elementary tract. So welcome everybody. Um, and this is just an update for anyone who saw the um, saw the webinars last year, then um, we, we sort of introduced our, our, our research project and introduced all our, our team members, which is a team of pathologists as well as a team of epidemiologists that are, are doing this sort of this project on basically fetal postmortems, but trying to Im improve things. So the the major objective for this project is to reduce pregnancy loss, reduce abortions. So we get more of just get my pointer up, more of these guys, these are the guys, and a whole lot less of these guys because that's not much fun. So we do this for, at two basic levels. We want to look at the individual mare level and to improve by improving the understanding of risk factors on the farm and for the various different causes of pregnancy loss, we can start 
doing management changes that will prevent further losses. But the other way is also at an industry level to detect outbreaks quicker and get in and set up systems to reduce the losses of that, that ongoing outbreak. And to do this, we need a really good surveillance system. So those are the two primary, uh, primary techniques that we're using to, to work on this system. So we'll be looking at, when we do this, we need to look at the various areas in that chain of events that occurs when we get a pregnancy loss, first the postmortem, then the lab testing, um, and then and the data analysis and the feedback to the farms to let you know what's actually going on. So in this area, we're working on training vets. Um, we're, we're also, we have developed some really good reference tools for the vets so that they can help make the diagnosis. As well as in, in the laboratory area, we've also, once again, we're going to be training pathologists and we've developed some really good reference material as well. And then the epidemiologists are mo mostly working in the data analysis um, and, and we'll, yeah, we'll go through and discuss all those in just a little bit more detail. So first of all, what's the team of epidemiologists doing and myself who's you know, working mostly with them? The first thing we did was um, we've created visual atlases for the, for the vets and the specialist pathologists. And this is provide, um, to provide a training material, um, to, to provide material for, for, for reference. And also we're developing a training program for veterinarians so that vets are upskilled in doing fetal postmortems. And I am working really hard on creating a really good database system for recording this, um, this all the information that we collect. So in this first ones, we some guy the wrong way in mind, the we've created this visual analysis. First thing we needed to do was list out all the causes there are of equine pregnancy loss in Australia so that we cover all the things that the vets might need to be looking at, looking for. And then we needed to go through really carefully, the team of the four, four pathologists, well, three pathologists and myself, go through really carefully and describe exactly what each of those causes of pregnancy loss are going to look like and you know, create tips for the vet. So that a good summary for them to, so this is what a herpes is going to look like, as well as lots of tables um, so that they can have quick references. The other aspect to it was to make sure we've got lots and lots of pictures. Once again, the best way when they when they get for the vets to get a good idea of what they're going to be looking for when they're doing the postmortem, lots and lots of good pictures is, is very, very helpful. Then we went through and did the same thing for, for, for the pathologists. So basically a really nice textbook for pathologists um, with really close detailed descriptions as well as um, lots and lots of images, lots of good tables, lots of tips for them, so that they, they've got a good idea of what, what they're going to be looking for when they get the samples to them from the vets. So those are virtually, the, well, the first draft of them, sort of the first edition of them as completed. As we go through in the next, in the finishing off phase one and moving into phase two of this project, um, we will be refining those based on the feedback we get from the vets and from ran from the pathologists. Um, so they're ninety nine percent complete, but they'll be they'll be tweaked to improve them even more um, for the vets and and pathologists that are going to be using it. The other another aspect of the work that I'm doing is is working out a system to train vets. And to start with, I've started with the Scone Equine Hospital vets. Um, and during 2020 and then 2021 particularly, I've been training the vets at Sky and Equine Hospital to do fetal postmortems. And actually they've been um, absolutely wonderful guinea pigs for me in that they've been providing feedback about how that training's working and so that we can develop an efficient system um, that can be rolled out across the country. Another part of the work, I'm, the work I'm doing is to get a secure electronic reporting system. We've, we've got a system that is a, basically an app that goes on an iPad that the vets can use while they're doing the postmortem. And, and it's, a, it's a lovely system in that it helps guide the vets 
through each part of the postmortem, collecting the history, looking at the outside of the foal and and abdomen. So, so they've got advice and help to sort of go through and know what to look for and then record the various different um, things that are important, um, as well as an opportunity to take lots and lots of photos, um, which is really, really helpful if they're wanting to look for any assistance um, in making the diagnosis, I can have a look at what they've what they've collected and give them, you know, give them much better advice. Um, but the other aspect of this system, if we're going to use it to be recording fetal postmortems from multiple places in Australia, we've got to make it really secure. It's absolutely crucial that it is only the, the only the vet doing the postmortem and the farm that submitted the fetus have any knowledge of the mayor's name and the farm. And so what we're doing, I'm working with an app developer as well at the moment, and you know, we're working out a system where the, if for the one that's not yours will be coded. They all get a code and you can only see the cases that the vet can only see the cases um, that they're actually working on. So that that's getting close to being up and running. Um, and we're hoping to use it in the phase two of the project that, that we'll be talking about a bit further later. So the other part of the team are the epidemiologists and um, <clears throat> they've been, they're working really hard at developing the baseline data that we'll need to start with for the surveillance system. In order for this surveillance system that we want, so the surveillance system is so that we can identify when we're getting an outbreak of abortions and what that's caused, what it, what's causing it, so we can get on and start trying to control the problem. Um, but for that to work well and automatically, which is what we want, what we need it to be an, an automatic system, um, you need to have good baseline data of knowing when and where abortions normally occur, um, so that when there's a bit of a when there's a blip. The, the, automatic, the system automatically notifies um, the people, the people that are responsible for initiating basically an emergency response. So we've started with the, with the ones in the Hunter Valley and they've, just, they've created these baseline graphs to see what, is, what, what happens. So when, during the year, uh, how many, you know, and at what stage of pregnancy these losses are occurring. So they've, they've got that started now, but that's going to be um, rolled out further. So in the chain of events that of the pregnancy loss investigation, the, this is the area that the epidemiologists work predominantly. I do a little bit of this, this work in data analysis in developing the, the, the database itself, but doing the analysis and getting all the baseline stuff so that we can actually do an effective and efficient surveillance system, that's the job of the epidemiologists. So they've already done that baseline study. Now we've got to refine it and develop a much better, develop the system. And, and in order to do that, they're going to need to do two projects. Um, the first project will be to find out a little bit better what actually happened last year. Really, it's going to be the best way to do it. Um, so they will be wanting to find out how many losses occurred, when they occurred, and what stage of pregnancy they occurred. So. Um, what they're going to want to do now is, what, what they want to do is send out a questionnaire. So we'll be looking at farms throughout the east coast of Australia and asking you what happened last year. Now this will be collected in a completely anonymous way, so nobody will know exactly where, exactly which farm or at what time abortions occurred but we'll get this overall normal pattern, so we'll, or this overall pattern, so we'll know what happened last year. That's, the, that's sort of the beginning of getting the information, so we've got a baseline to start working on what, what is basically an artificial intelligence system. That, and, that hopeful, and that's where we're looking for participation from the studs. The, the data that we get and how good the surveillance system that we can set up will be will be dependent on how good the data we get back from you. So if, when you're invited to participate in this questionnaire, um, it will be, it, you know, you are contributing and will be contributing enormously to improving um, and reduce, uh, reducing the number of losses in the, due to abortions. The other, 
the other the other study that will be going will be happening which is going to work um, closely with phase two phase one and phase two of the project is what we call a case control study now this a case control study is where you get a case so an abortion which will be a case and then you look at two other mares on the same farm that didn't abort and you'll ask specific questions about about the case and get the same information about the um, the controls the mares that didn't abort and both sort of things factors like mare factors what the cause of the abortion will be recorded and environment where she was living what she was eating what time of year what the weather was like um, a whole lot of de details like that and you'll compare between the cases that did the cases and the controls and see what was different and this will give us um, what we call risk factors and once you know risk factors you can go about reducing them and if you reduce your risk factors you reduce your abortions so it'll be important for the overall surveillance system but it'll also give you information that you'll be able to use basically next year so or the year after so you'll you'll have information that will help you start to reduce your pregnancy losses pretty much straight away even without going through and developing a surveillance system. We have completed the epidemiologist led also one part of the project in the early years of this and which was the scoping review of the literature which is we went back for 60 years of the literature on pregnancy loss around the whole world to see what was reported what was common what people were most concerned about and what patterns were changing and this paper's just been accepted which is a tremendous achievement um, and what we found were that of the infectious causes of abortion, herpes was the most commonly reported. So that was the one that gets researchers most excited and most concerned. And certainly back in the 60s and 70s, there was a great deal we needed to learn about herpes. And as a result of it, the incidence of herpes has reduced quite a lot, um, particularly in the major thoroughbred breeding areas of the world with vaccination and really good biosecurity. The other thing that was interesting about that is, is that leptospirosis, which is a zoonotic disease, is quite, co a, quite a common cause of abortion around the world, but it isn't one we see in Australia. So that, that was quite interesting. And so, but I do think we need to keep an eye out that. That's something we need to keep monitoring and would be one of the really useful tools of having a, having a surveillance system is that we would be able to pick up if we suddenly start to get leptospirosis and that is really important because leptospirosis is a dreadful disease for for people to get as well as obviously being a disaster for the pregnancy interestingly a couple of other zoonoses that have cropped up here in australia the one coxiella which is q fever and chlamydia cytokai which we've had some outbreaks of um, are also being increasingly reported throughout the world um, which is quite important because once again the people, when you're dealing with an abortion, you're frequently associated with a lot of infected fluid and it's very hard to keep things under control. So we need to understand what risks there are to people um, because both Q fever and psittacosis can be really, really serious diseases. Um, and we certainly don't want to see people getting very sick with that. The other thing that we discovered is that as everywhere else in the world with we're similar to everyone else in that umbilical cord torsion is the most common cause of non-infectious abortion it causes probably 20 to 30 percent of all pregnancy losses and it's similar and that's similar to what's reported in the rest of the world so what's our next step um, basically it's helping with completing our phase one um, and that will be supporting the epidemiologists in their in their questionnaires and their surveys that would be really getting that information is what we are wanting to get to for your participation because um, that will give us the best opportunity to get great information and that that will then allow us to provide you with the best advice that you can get in order to reduce abortions um, and I just want to remind you that this data will be completely anonymous. No one will know that it was your farm that had any abortions or which mares it will be. 
Um, but we will we will be able to sort of determine what region. So it'll be done regionally rather than you know by farm by farm or definitely not mayor by mayor. So it'll be just completely anonymous um, if you participate. So I'd really encourage you all to participate. But the really exciting bit is the step on to phase two. So the groundwork is, phase one is basically the groundwork, getting things set up, getting you know, the abortion system set up, starting to train vets, getting the electronic recording system set up, and then getting that reference material, it's all established. So that is, you know, really has progressed well, and we've got the vast majority of that done. It just needs to be refined. And we were you know, planning on refining it this 12 months, um, but with the opportunity of phase two, we'll be able to really nail down where the problems are and get a system that is working really well. So it's the wonderful opportunity that we have got um, funding now um, that will be able to support the investigation of up to, I think, 250 fetal postmortems over the next two years. So. This means those the abortion investigations will be done at no cost to the owner. Um, that's the really wonderful thing, and that will that. But we will use it to go into this research system. So you will the vets. So what we'll be doing is training specific vets in Queensland, New South Wales, and Victoria. So we'll continue training the Skynet One Hospital vets, but we'll pick the. We've got a practice in Victoria, a partner practice in Victoria, and a partner practice in Queensland who we are training them up at the moment to be able to, to do fetal postmortems. Um, and the other thing we'll be doing is training the pathologists in the labs that the work goes to so that they can recognise what the major causes of equine pregnancy loss are and can give the vets a really good idea uh, of, you know, and give them some advice and help. And the aim of this is so that we can find out if there are any problems, and particularly um, one of the things is we've limited it. Unfortunately, if you want to participate in this system, the, the samples have to go to one of these three practices. Um, and we're doing that so that we keep control of it because at the moment we've got to test everything and particularly test the security of the of the system. And and so we don't want information that, you know, private information leaking out. Um, and we think we've got the system working, but just in case there's a Hit, hit. We we want this in a very controlled system, so that what so that we've got complete confidence that when it's ready to roll out, it'll be completely secure, and the system will work well, and it will be able to roll out, um, roll it more more easily. So, with with phase two is this initial area of Queensland Victoria, yeah, you know, one practice in Queensland Victoria, New South Wales. The ultimate aim is to get it to go Australia-wide. Um, and so we, that's the purpose of the next two years in phase two. Now, the TBA have come on board to help support this and help administer this. And James is going to talk a great deal more about what their role is and give you a lot more information about phase two and how to participate in it. But that's my end of the phase two, that I'll be doing the work and trying to train the vets and get the system working really well. And, um, and James will tell you how they're going to get their system re working really um, as efficiently as possible. So that's the all I need to, to participate in. Um, and I'll need to stop sharing. Thank you, Joan. That was a great insight. Um, do we have any questions for Joan? I'm sure there'll be a few if we can get some of Raise a hand or pop a question in the chat box. Uh, Carl, did you have your hand up? Uh, my wife did, Justine. <laughs> oh, <laughs> right. <laughs> You're okay. Hey, Justine, how are you tonight? Good, thank you. Well, just a, a couple of Good. quick questions, Joan, if I um, could ask them. And that was a very informative session, and I wish I'd seen last year's presentation as well. Um, with regards to the risk factors, are you including stresses that may include weather, particular weather events or weather conditions yes. as some of those risk factors? And then also, uh, is it only applicable to thoroughbred breeds or is this something to really extend right across any stud who's breeding any type of horse in terms of infectious herpes and those sorts of things? And then 
at what stage in the pregnancy are you considering it an abortion and is it only if you find the fetus um, or is it if um, you know you get to a certain point past a, a, a beyond into the pregnancy and you just mm. describe it then as a reabsorption as a, yeah, instead yeah, of an abortion yeah. Great question, and it covers a lot of the various different parts. And some of it's the epidemiology. Um, now you, you'll have to remind me of you. First. I'll ask, answer your last question first because I can remember it. We might have to go back and, and check. But they, they, um, we will be, yeah. The epidemiologists will be looking at um, when the abortion occurred. So that that questionnaire will be. Um, finding out whether the abortion was seen, whether there was a diagnosis, and how many pregnancy losses occurred without it being seen. So those mares that have, a, say, a 45-day pregnancy, positive pregnancy test, and then when you preg test them in May, June, July, um, they come up empty, but nobody saw anything in between. They'll be included, and they are um, they're not part of phase two, because phase two is the investigation of all the abortions. But the epidemiologists in that questionnaire will cover that those sort of topics. Um, the first question, I think, was weather. Is that right, Justine? The weather... Yeah, um, the risk yeah. factors. Yeah. yeah, the risk factors will be as wide as we can make them. It was, it's, it was interesting. We've just been working on developing the questionnaire, and one of the things that really worried me about it about it was how long it was because there were so many questions we wanted to ask. So we've, and, and a lot of them were are the weather. Um, the other thing about it is as we get at what time of year they did occur, you know, each abortion occurred. And we did this with the Hunter Valley abortions that, you know, the, that the epidemiologist says, you know what time of year it did? You can get pretty good um, data from the Weather Bureau um, through the weather stations of what the prevailing weather was as well. So, so yeah, that factors that sort of factors in with the epidemiologist. So we're definitely looking at weather forecasting, uh, you know, weather events, um, and you know whether it had been a rainy year, a wet year, um, you know, a particularly dry year. Um, that, so yeah, those are really important factors. Now there was one other question, and do you, have I answered all your questions? I think I'm. No, it was just. A whether or not it was extending to all horse breeders or simply yeah. narrow to the thoroughbred breeding at the moment? Well, at the moment, it's supported by um, it's supported by the thoroughbred breeders levy. So mm -hmm. it is this is restricted to thoroughbreds only because it's being paid for basically by thoroughbreds. Um, and the initial, the sort of the AgriFutures is a thoroughbred research project. So right now it is um, it's restricted in that way. So the funding is is restricted, but the information that we've got those resources on how to do a post mortem, what what to look for for the vets that are doing them, that will be available to that'll be freely available once it, it'll go up on the AgriFutures website, and all that information will be available. And the other information is the results of those questionnaires and all the details that we find out about when, where, how, what risk factors they are. Once again, that will be available for all breeders in Australia, but the actual abortion investigations in the next two years, phase two, that is limited to thoroughbred mares. So there's nothing been, nothing similar to this particular project that's been conducted internationally, for example, through the Irish Stud? Not that I'm aware of nationally. Um, the there are different systems in um in by in the uk and in kentucky particularly kentucky are really lucky in that they they have a sort of surveillance system and that they all their abortions are funded by the government um and they go through the their veterinary diagnostic laboratory so so that's you know they do all breeds and it's always free so you know that's just an incredibly privileged existence for them um and they have a a, a bit of a surveillance system um, but yeah, but no, yeah, at the moment it is just restricted to Australian thoroughbreds. Um, and it, you know, the other, if the other breeds are keen to do this sort of thing and participate, then it'll be just a matter of coming, you know, coming in and discussing things and trying to, trying to, you know, bring the funding in is really what, you know, it's, it's sort of, it's whoever pays the piper, um, gets the work really. Um, and the thoroughbreds have got them got themselves sorted and organised for it. So it'd uh, be great to see. I'd love to see the other breeds doing it. 
Yeah, the dairy industry is pretty sophisticated and quite advanced in terms of their um, breeding program. They actually run a computer generated model that hangs around their cattle necks mm. and they can tell when the cow's in heat what its um, production is, a whole range of other things if it's got a temperature. Is that likely the surveillance program that you're talking about? Is that something that could actually extend that far that rather than us simply having a collar with a tag on it around our brood mare's neck to be able to differentiate them in a herd, that you could actually take this sophisticated system and engage something that ends up being microchipped related to a horse and they wear it? I think that, yeah, I think that would be a brilliant system to get get established because it's certainly in the both the beef cattle and the, and the dairy cattle industries, it's really starting to, you know, those sort of surveillances are really starting to take off. But at the moment, we're just, you know, looking at picking up the abortion basically and, and, and starting off. But, yeah, it's got enormous potential. Once you've got a surveillance system built, there's enormous potential to build on it because you've got the framework and with the support of AgriFutures, um, we could continue doing further research to, to sort of build other and add other automatic because we'll have, um, you know, we'll, certainly it's there. And, and once you've got the framework, it's much easier to add on to it. So, yeah, I think that'd be a great idea. As, do we have time, Annalise, for a question from Catherine? It looks like she's got a question. Oh, yeah, all right, this one. Just That's for you, Catherine. Why, thank you, Joan. Thanks, Annalise. I, I really just wanted to um, make sure that everybody uh, on the webinar understands what an extraordinary resource has been gathered by this project. And to my knowledge, there isn't anything like this that's been got together, all of the information in the atlases across the world. So it will be a resource which actually serves the thoroughbred industry and the horse breeding industry across the world. And I think that's something that should really be applauded. It's been a phenomenal effort by the team and I'd just like to congratulate you on your good work, Joan. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's certainly been a team effort and, and what's been the best part of it is, is just having this wonderful team that works so well together. It's just, it's energising and enthusiastic and I've learned so much. It's great. I've really loved it. So, yeah. Thank you. I will now welcome James Murray of Thoroughbred Breeders Australia. How are you, James? Good, thanks, Charmaine. I just thought to begin with, I just, again, um, echo the sentiments of Catherine there, just this fantastic presentation um, by Joan and a lot of hard work and uh, long hours to go into that, but hopefully it's um, it's built the foundation to really build into the future. Definitely. Now, James, you might be a new face to some in the industry. Um, you're the Marketing and Projects Coordinator for TBA. How long have you been in this role for? Yeah, so I've obviously joined Tom um, here and Cecilia at TBA in the last three months. Um, uh, coming off, I guess, a horse sort of background, I uh, was in the Hunter Valley for the last couple of years working on a farm. Um, but yeah, really great to be a part of the team. And uh, I've met quite a few breeders already. And I'm sure, I'm, I'm look, I should say, I'm looking forward to getting to meet a lot more of you. And uh, hopefully tonight I can uh, shed some light on TBA in our role. Um, on, in phase two and explain phase two uh, with a little bit more detail. Well, James, thank you for that introduction. I might let you jump straight in and explain the part that you and TBA will play in this role. So I'll get you to uh, kick off from there. Yeah, fantastic. Just give me a sec. Hopefully everyone's got that set up. Um, so just to begin with phase two, obviously Joan touched on it, is uh, the post-mortem of late-term pregnancy loss. So just to build the uh, foundations and start with, I just wanted to touch on how uh, AgriFutures and Thoroughbred Breeders Australia have kind of come together. So obviously AgriFutures is a government-established research and development corporation, um, and that's really come from TBA when we've successfully lobbied the Australian government in the past to match the thoroughbred research and development levy. Uh, so for every mare bred in Australia, there's a $10 fee paid by the mare owner and the stallion owner. And then this is matched starting in 2017 by the federal government. So each year that equates to up to nearly a uh, million dollars per annum, which is a fantastic resource and, uh, and a huge amount of money to go towards R&D each year and ultimately is funding um, a program which I'm about to delve into a little bit more. 
So obviously with this thoroughbred levy, there is an industry advisory panel um, with people such as Mike Becker uh, in Victoria, Mike, Michael Grieve uh, in Queensland, Derek Field um, for Widden. And these are the type of people um, include as well as us. We're kind of listening and making sure this money is going to the right places, which kind of leads me into um, this project, which is abortion. And obviously the massive loss the feedback I should say we're getting is the massive loss that abortions have on the thoroughbred industry year in and year out. So Joan touched on uh, phase one, how it's how it's being successful in the questionnaire. And obviously that was just done in the Hunter Valley uh, region in New South Wales. But with phase two, we've expanded that to southern Queensland and northern Victoria. So really expanding our reach. And the two clinics chosen uh, outside New South Wales, which she also touched on, are Darling Down Vets, which is in Queensland, just outside Toowoomba, and then Goulburn Valley Equine Unit uh, in Shepparton, Victoria. So I really want to touch on why this project is important um, for the industry and then you guys as breed as a whole. If you take one thing out of tonight, I, I'd hope it to be this. So as I said, so much of the feedback we're getting is is how costly abortions can be and that's why these you know on a micro sort of scale these free postmortems are a massive plus to, uh, to any farm in particularly um i've been here especially farms um who, who, who that build their business on adjustment and have adjustment properties uh if you if you've got a small amount of mares and a client doesn't really want to fund the post-mortem it, it, it kind of is put back onto the farm or the business itself this uh, this phase two and these funds from agri-futures are really there to help these farms out and then linking into that hopefully by doing the post-mortems in a micro scale you can catch those abortion storms that can happen on farms from a larger perspective and looking at a, a macro sort of point of view, the greater good of the industry is here, which Joan kind of touched on. And, and hopefully by creating this database and in the future as we grow and build to a national scale after these pilot stages are complete, we can really gain a deeper understanding of the industry through those trends and, and build a greater understanding on the causes. And this, hopefully, fingers crossed, will then lead to a long-term decline in abortions in the industry, which is a success for us. Well, from our perspective, a success, and I'm sure as breeders, you can agree, that'll also be a success. I really um, want to emphasise and touch on the role of TBA uh, in this second phase. So we are here to make this as easy as possible, in simple terms, for you guys as breeders. We are here to communicate, we're here to do the administration, but that is where it ends. We want to make it as simple as possible, so we'll do all the payments, we'll help facilitate understandings, which will start to push in the coming weeks, including information packs with more details, and help agri-futures with administrative side. But we're simply here, uh, in, in simple terms I should say, to make it as easy as possible for the breeders and make this as smooth as possible. Joan uh, really articulated the confidentiality. I just want to, uh, again, point out that TBA will have zero access to any of the data and any of the regions. We're simply there just working out the invoicing and the payments and helping breeders um, involved with the program, the project. From a, again, from a TBA sort of point of view, I wanted to point out some of the clear objectives. So obviously we want to provide breed, breeders with the funds to undertake these post-mortems. If breeders uh, are, are, have access to them, hopefully they'll get better management of their mares and then in the future, obviously help their farms and their business as a whole. On a grand scale, this data collected to identify trends and causes in the late-term pregnancy loss is going to help um, and prevent those mid to late term pregnancy losses in the future. And then finally, um, again, just recapping what Joan has said, just building that national surveillance system uh, to really help out the industry as a whole. I know that was sort of brief, but hopefully that gave a greater kind of understanding. In the next couple of weeks, we're really going to make a, a push um, to push out those data packs with more information how to get involved. If anyone has any questions, I'm here and yeah, thank you so much for listening. Thank you, James. That was great to hear about TBA's role in um, in the project. Um, now, does anyone have any questions for James? 
Not currently, unless I can't see someone. Well, if you do, James obviously has his details um, that were up on screen, or you can jump on the TBA website and get in touch with him directly there. Um, but I'm sure you're going to hear uh, some more from James in the coming months um, as the project really gets underway.